Welcome again, everyone, from wherever you're joining us. Uh, my name is Margaret Gatonye, and I will be a facilitator for today. I'm a first year PhD student at the Global Governance and Human Security Program here at the McCormick School. And I'm delighted and excited to have you all join us today. Um, we have amazing lineup today, and we will be listening from an amazing uh, professor who will be talking a lot about her experiences. But before we get there, I would like to welcome Professor Idozie to give us some opening mm. remarks. Uh, okay. Welcome again. This is our first event, uh, Black History African Series event, organized by the African Scholars Forum here at UMass Boston. Uh, Professor Idozie, go ahead. Thank you, Meg. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're all about Southern Africa today. Are you listening to that music? Did you get in on time? Uh, fascinating. That was, um, as Meg said, Dr. He was a doctor, the, the young artist uh, from Malawi, Dr. Namandingo, and his his 91 year old uh, mashup artist. Um, he sought him out to put together this wonderful collaboration of Malawian uh, folklorish music. Uh, the 91 year old um, is called uh, Gires Chalamanda, and um, that was a um, um, an array of his tunes um, that is hitting Facebook. You know, um, it was just wonderful music. I couldn't help but curate it. Well, good afternoon, um, everyone, and welcome uh, to uh, today's event. I'm Rita Kiki uh, Idozi. I'm, of course, a professor here at uh, UMass Boston, and I'm the associate dean at the John W. McCormick uh, Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. I'm also the chair of the Africa Scholars uh, Forum, uh, hosting today's event. Um, this is our first Black History is African History <laughs> event um, at the Forum. Um, when Carter G. Woodson uh, created Negro History Week in 1926, he wanted all people to know, and his words, that being African should be a point of pride and celebration. Taking uh, Woodson's intention further, Malcolm X was known to remind us all that African-Americans, our history did not begin in chains. Millions of Africans lived and died before the idea of the transatlantic slave trade would come into being. Uh, by standard curriculum, young school children do not learn that the human race is of African origin. The oldest known skeletal remains of modern humans or homo sapiens as we know ourselves today were excavated at sites in East Africa. Human remains were discovered at a place called Omo in Ethiopia that were dated at 195,000 years old, the oldest known in the world. We don't know that Africans calculated and erected some of the greatest monuments ever, the pyramids, the Sphinx, which the Washington Monument is a direct copy of will have always stood in Africa. So during Black History Month, children should know about lessons um, about our history uh, that consist of the ancient Egyptians who were Africans that had arguably the most influential civilization of our time. Kingdoms of Aksum, Mali, Songhai, and Kush all rivaled the dominance and territorial gain of ancient Greece or Europe in their day. And in South Africa, where we turn to today, um, Black history tells us about the fact that at least 70,000 years ago, deep in South Africa, traces of modern men and women have been found. In 2002, in the Blombos caves of South Africa. I've actually been there in the Cape um, of South Africa. The earliest abstract art was discovered and believed to be 
from that period the earliest art ever found. All right, <laughs> we've got a lot of um, in store for you today, mostly our keynote address by Professor Layla Brown, who is also a recent Fulbright Scholar at the University of Johannesburg, I think, in South Africa. Uh, her talk is titled um, Around That Experience um, on Writing and Resilience, What My Time in South Africa Taught Me, um, and about a, a resistance and scholarly uh, production. We've got a lot more musical interludes uh, for you uh, from powerful and talented South African women artists. And uh, following the event, uh, we do have our business meeting and uh, you're free to um, join us um, at 3.15. Um, okay, a few other of my colleagues um, are here and would like to join me in welcoming you. Uh, first, I am, I'm here with uh, the Dean of uh, the McCormick Graduate School and his name is Dean David Cash. Over to you, David. Thank you so much, Associate Dean Adozi, and thank you so much, Associate Dean Adozi. I say that twice, once for saying, well, for welcoming me, me, and the uh, other thank you is for creating the Africa Scholars Forum, this network on campus, and actually that goes beyond the campus, that brings together people who are studying and teaching about Africa, doing research there or here about Africa, uh, in Africa or the diaspora. And you can see as you look around uh, the, the Zoom page, I, 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 I'm not sure I'm getting it right, but at least three colleges are represented here. And I don't know how many departments and their graduate students and there's faculty and their staff who are here. So uh, this is a new community, a latent community that, uh, that uh, Associate Dean Adozi, you have created. And thank you so much for that. And uh, these events are always filled with energy and uh, introspection and uh, thought provocation, and of course, music. Um, I also just want to note, this is a really interesting time on this campus and really interesting as we go through Black History Month. This is the first Black History Month since the murder of George Floyd. And I think what we all see is a long and coming reckoning. We don't know how real that reckoning will be. We hope that it will be. We're working hard that it will lead to structural change and address long held uh, issues of, of um, racial uh, discrimination and inequities. And um, I love how this is cast as Black History and in Africa um, series. Um, for those of you who were able to go last night, the entire university is reading the, the book Homegoing. And of course that traces the 400 plus years of uh, colonial Africa colonial North America and the intertwining familial relationships over those hundreds and hundreds of years that paint the picture of the black experience in Africa and in, in North America. And so the time is right to be having these conversations. And uh, so again, th thank you, Kiki. Thank you, Margaret and Gifty for uh, making these events happen. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you, David. And Meg? Thank you very much, uh, Dean Kash, and thank you, Professor Idozi, for that amazing welcome. And indeed, I do believe that being African should be a part of pride. Um, I'm going to welcome Balkisa to introduce uh, Paxa. Balkisa, if you're joining us. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Meg. Uh, thank you, Professor Idozi. Uh, thank you, Dean David Kash. Uh, my name is Balkisa Diallo. And I'm a PhD student um, in the Global Governance and Human Security Program. I'm also the public relations officers of the Pan-African Graduate Student Association, PAXA. So PAXA was inspired by the by UMass Boston First Africa Day in February 2019. And the team, the team was Pan-African Rising. So PAXA has been established as a UMass Boston registered uh, student organization for graduate students and advanced uh, undergraduate students who engage in the study and uh, scholarship of Africa and its uh, diaspora. Um, the association meets to discuss, uh, deliberate and organize uh, programming and research around topics on the core study of uh, the African continent 
of its diaspora and of its uh, diverse people, states, societies, and institutions around the globe. The association is especially dedicated to the advancement of uh, African social, economic, and political progress through its member initiatives and activities. And we are happy to be part of the Africa Scholar Forum and helping with the programming of events. Thank you. Leila Brown Vincent is an assistant professor of Africana studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, right here. Um, Leila earned her PhD in cultural anthropology uh, from Duke University, uh, where her research focused on Black racial identity formation in Latin America and the US and its impact on Black radical organizing in the era of Black Lives Matter. She is currently working on her first book manuscript uh, called Return to the Source, um, the Dialectics of 21st Century Pan-African Liberation based largely on her dissertation research. Leila spent all of 2020 as a visiting research fellow at the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study, um, at the, and, and that's at the University of Johannesburg, I believe, where her research expanded to examine the crisis of racial capitalism and the COVID-19 pandemic. Her most recent scholarly work, The um, Pandemic of Racial Capitalism, Another World is Possible can be found in um, the journal, uh, The European South, a transdisciplinary journal of post-colonial humanities. I am very pleased to welcome uh, Leila Brown um, to our first uh, Black History in Africa uh, speaker series. Leila, you have the space. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to say again, thank you to Professor Zidozi and uh, Dean Cash and the Africa Scholars Forum for inviting me to share some things with you all today. Um, I typically, so um, when I went to Johannesburg in February, I was actually a, a writing fellow for the first four months. And then my position was um, continued into a visiting research fellowship. And so today I want to share um, some excerpts from the article that was mentioned um, that was published um, from my time and to actually talk about how the time that I had sort of away from um, the kind of administrative and teaching responsibilities of UMass made that possible, um, really made it possible to write, uh, edit, and have an article peer reviewed and published in six months. Um, so I want to start um, with a quick video um, to just take us back to, to what was happening this summer. From Brazil to Iran, thousands have gathered to show solidarity with U.S. protests over the killing of George Floyd. He died after a Minneapolis cop kneeled on his neck for nearly nine minutes. The worldwide events echoed peaceful messages in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. In South America, hundreds of protesters came together outside Rio de Janeiro's state government building on May 31st. They demanded an end to police brutality against Black people within Rio's working class neighborhoods, known as favelas. Iranians held a small demonstration outside the Swiss embassy. Two Syrian artists painted a mural in memory of Floyd in war-torn Idlib. And in Israel, a group gathered to protest the killing of Iyad al-Halek, an autistic Palestinian man, as well as Floyd. In London, demonstrators marched through the city and around the U.S. Embassy, defying the U.K.'s coronavirus restrictions that prohibit mass gatherings. Protesters kneeled in unison, chanting, no justice, no peace, in Trafalgar Square. While the protests have mostly been peaceful, there have been some clashes with the police. And statues of slave traders were torn down across England. Protesters threw the statue of slave trader Edward Colston into the harbor on Sunday. 
In Belgium, city officials removed the statue of colonial King Leopold II. This came after protesters vandalized and torched the statue. Protests against police brutality also formed throughout Berlin. Demonstrators gathered around the U.S. Embassy, chanting, Black Lives Matter! 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 Black li In Italy, Black Lives Matter protesters surrounded the U.S. consulate. The country is only beginning to ease lockdown, so they appear to be social distancing. Across France, more than 23,000 protesters took to the streets. Demonstrators in Paris kneeled in silence for 8 minutes and 46 seconds in homage to Floyd. In Ireland, over 150 protesters gathered with signs reading The World is Watching on June 1st. They gathered again the next day outside of the U.S. Embassy. We're here about the injustice of Black lives being lost every day at the hands of the police authority in the United States, and not only in the United States. Racism is a global issue. Protesters also called for an end to racism in Canada, where a recent police killing of a black man and another death currently under investigation have inflamed tensions. These protests merged with calls for solidarity with U.S. demonstrators rallying against Floyd's death. In New Zealand, around 4,000 protesters took to the streets of Auckland for rallies and vigils on June 1st. Crowds gathered outside the U.S. consulate. In Australia, protesters called out systemic racism as well as Aboriginal deaths in police custody in their own country. Protests demanding justice and an end to racist policing are expected to continue this week. So I wanted to share that, like I said, to take us back to um, a lot of the things that were happening over the summer. And the reason why I think it's important for me to start there is because um, it was an important place of departure for the writing of the piece that I'm gonna share with you today. So I will read a few excerpts um, and then I will um, explain some things and then hopefully we'll open up for, for a good conversation. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, uh, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. This is a quote by Milton Freeman. It is not without hesitation that I begin my presentation today with the words of a man whose theories of quote economic liberalism were used to usher in an era of rampant neoliberal reforms which sustained coups against populist regimes in Chile and Argentina and almost single-handedly led the effort to privatize, to privatize New Orleanian public schools in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Freeman's quote provides critical context for the development of what he called shock treatment and what Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine subsequently exposed as a fundamentalist form of capitalism, which has always needed disasters to advance. The crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, as exploited by neoliberal regimes, perpetuates suffering for the common people while the wealthy few, like Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, becomes richer than ever. Despite the havoc it continues to wreak, the pandemic also has the potential to inspire a radical socioeconomic shift across the globe, which could lead to a better quality of life for most of the world's population, a potential we must acknowledge as we seek to envision alternative futures. My time as a writing fellow at the Johannesburg Institute provided me with dedicated time to read, think, share, and participate in the community of writers and creative writers and scholars that resulted in the peer review publication of the materials I will present today in a matter of six months. My article, The Pandemic of Racial Capitalism, Another World is Possible, is the first in a body of work I aim to produce that turned the aforementioned quote by Milton Friedman on his head by using the COVID-19 crisis to expose the deadliness of neoliberal social economic logic and to point to places to watch as we envision alternative futures. When I first discovered in the summer of 2019 that I had been awarded a writing fellowship in Johannesburg to begin in February 2020, the world had no idea that we would be approaching the end of life as we have come to know it. In recent years, I have developed a deep fascination with apocalyptic genres of film and literature, including dystopian fantasies like The Hunger Games, The Children of Men, Handmaid's Tale, 
uh, zombie apocalypses like The Walking Dead, World War Z, and 28 Days Later, and disaster films like Contagion, Twister, and San Andreas. No doubt some of these films and novels leave much to be desired. However, what I find most interesting about this particular genre are their meditations on the human condition. Each of these offers some version of what the authors and their co-creators envision human beings will return or possibly devolve to when the end of the world as we know it arrives. What's more, these fictional accounts issue renderings of the apocalypse as the so-called end of days on earth and speak more to the etymology of the word as a revelation or an unveiling, an unfolding of things previously unknown, though not necessarily new. As the world grapples with the rising COVID-related death toll, the recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Rashard Brooks in the US, and of Collins Kosa, um, Petrus Miggles in South Africa and, and Petrus Miggles in South Africa have reunited the flames of indignation felt by black and brown peoples all over the world. The manner of death and subsequent handling of these cases and countless others reveals the anti-people logic of the neoliberal state, dictating the daily operations of the US and its crony countries, specifically Brazil, whose police killings have increased during the pandemic and disproportionately targeted Afro-Brazilians. While the US government struggles with its nearly insurmountable difficulties by its profit-driven healthcare system, coupled with its gross lack of willingness to take the pandemic seriously, it becomes abundantly clear that while Corona is a virus of pandemic proportions, the true pandemic is racial capitalism. I want to pause there and, and um, share the story of two people who were um, murdered in South Africa when I was there. So the first is Collins Kosa. So I don't know how many of you all know, but um, when South Africa enacted its lockdown, one of the measures that it decided to undertake was to make uh, alcohol and cigarettes illegal. Um, and I believe it was one of only four or five countries in the world that did that as a in response to COVID. Um, and the logic being that alcoholism is a major issue in South Africa, um, that it often overwhelms the healthcare system. And so presumably by making alcohol and cigarettes illegal um, during the pandemic, somehow that would make room in the hospitals um, for potential COVID cases. Um, the problem with this is that it then became punishable by the, a, a thing that is normally um, permitted, legal, uh, sanctioned, condoned by the state, then became punishable um, by a fine, imprisonment, and in the case of at least a handful of people, death. Um, so the first of which is Collins Kosa. Um, who was a 40 year old uh, man who died, or I shouldn't say that, who was murdered on April 10th in the city's poor, poor township of Alexandra, or Alex, um, is, which is how it's commonly referred to, following an altercation in his yard with security forces. They, the police officers accused him of drinking alcohol in public, an offense under emergency regulations, which was put into place to prevent the spread of corona. Uh, witnesses say soldiers and police officers strangled Kosa, slammed his head against the cement wall and steel gate, and hit him with the butt of a rifle. Afterwards, he was unable to walk and talk. He began vomiting and a few hours later, he was dead. He was pronounced dead. Around the same time, just as the lockdown began, another person, Petrus Miggles, uh, in the Cape Town area was also murdered. So on, a, on March 27, 2020, on the first day of the lockdown, 56-year-old Petrus or Pete Man Miggles went to buy two bottles of beer for his neighbor in Cape Town. Two police officers in a double cab a uh, van pulled up next to him as he was walking back to deliver the beers and stopped uh, and stopped him. An eyewitness reports that the police officer in the passenger seat got out, grabbed the and grabbed the beer from Miggles. Then the driver got out and began hitting him. The two police officers tried to load him into the van, but when they couldn't get him into the van, they put him on the front and drove off. Shortly after Miggles returned to his home, he collapsed of a heart attack, um, which it was determined was precipitated by the beating from police. Um, and I want to share these two stories because for a number of reasons, um, I, I find I found it very, um, you know, inspiring um, that there were global protests all over the world following the death of George Floyd. And I mean, we see this often. We, uh, I even did a presentation recently where I compare, compared it to the same types of um, global protests that kind of uh, sprang up in the wake of Ferguson in these moments. And these, this is something that is sort of my general preoccupation. I'm always interested in the ways in which global um, enunciations of black solidarity are made. One of the reasons um, why I wanted to highlight these two cases was that even in South Africa, um, the news covered more of George Floyd's death than these two men's death. 
um, particularly as they were occurring. And so I wanted to pull their names to, to, to the front so that we have them on our minds as I keep presenting. Um, I'm going back to the text now. Drawing on Oliver Cromwell Cox's description of the United States as the quote, lusty child of an already highly developed capitalism, Sharice Burdenstelli's articulation of racial capitalism notes that one of the many techniques deployed and perfected by the US in its pursuit of accumulated wealth was its quote, lack of concern for the political and economic welfare of the overwhelming masses of its population, least of all the descendants of the enslaved. In this sense, the pandemic of racial capitalism as it manifests through, the, through COVID-19 is truly apocalyptic. If we take as a point of comparison the neoliberal logics of disposability of life at play in the handling of the pandemic in the US, alongside the communal logics undergirding socialist projects which attempt to preserve life in Venezuela, we might begin to have a better understanding of the multiple worlds that exist and perhaps find ways of being that are much more conducive to conditions of life. More importantly, we might begin to see the ways in which an entirely different conception of global order is possible, even if flawed. The COVID pandemic has forced several contradictions to the surface where world order conceptions are concerned, particularly in regards, in regards to which communities are deemed expendable and who the state believes needs to be regulated and controlled. Racialism, sorry, racism and capitalism mutually construct harmful social conditions that fundamentally shape COVID-19, the COVID-19 disease and social inequalities. Uh, let's see if there's one more slide. On Monday, March 23rd, um, 2020, with only 77 confirmed cases, um, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro announced a series of measures to prevent a catastrophic loss of life in the country. These measures included a six month suspension of commercial and residential rents um, uh, and a, a six month suspension of capital and interest payments on loans. Public and private sector workers were guaranteed a special government bonus. Job dismissals as a result of quarantine were outlawed a special agricultural plan to ensure the contents of local food production and provision committees boxes would be available to over 7 million families and telecommunications companies were barred from cutting customer service for six months. President Maduro concluded his public announcement by assuring the Venezuelan people that he would use all of his power and consciousness to protect jobs and the most vulnerable people during the lockdown. Cuba, on the other hand, was busy sending teams of medical doctors to foreign countries like Italy and South Africa as part of its longstanding global medical diplomacy program, which was developed and realized as a project of the Cuban Revolution. As Cuba and Venezuela worked to help maintain, sorry, to help contain the virus at home and abroad, the U.S. government was busy, busy covertly orchestrating multiple coup attempts. Cuba and Venezuela represent the two countries in the Western Hemisphere with the longest standing national experimentations with socialist political government governance. Sorry. They also happen to be among the countries in the hemisphere with some of the most promising COVID-19 containment programs thus far. On the opposite end of the political spectrum, Venezuela's southern neighbor, Brazil, under Jair Bolsonaro and the, U and the US leadership under Trump, consistently ranked in the top three COVID hotspots globally. During the first two weeks of June, Brazil and the United States continued to ease lockdown restrictions despite recording some of the highest rates of virus contraction and death since the pandemic began. Brazilian President Bolsonaro reportedly referred to the coronavirus as a quote, little flu, and later declared that he was sorry about all the dead, but that was everyone's destiny. At the same time that Venezuela was implementing laws and policies to ensure the lives and livelihoods of its citizens over the first six months of the pandemic, Donald Trump, after reluctantly advising citizens to stay home, was already contemplating reopening the country for business in late March. Trump's party mate, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, sent a letter to Fox News anchor Tucker Carlson uh, saying the following, I think there's a lot of grandparents who would agree with me that I want my grandchildren to live in, in the America I did. I want them to have a shot at the American dream, but right now the virus, which all experts say that 98% of people will survive, is killing our country in another way. It could bring about a total economic collapse and potentially a collapse of our society. So I say, let's give this a few more days or weeks, but then let's get back to work. Um, in a March 23rd Fox News interview Tucker Carlson, uh, with Tucker Carlson, uh, Governor Pat sorry, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick further asserted, 
Tucker, no one reached out to me and said, as a senior citizen, are you willing to take a chance on your survival in exchange for keeping the America that all, Ameri that all Americans love for your children and grandchildren? And if that's the exchange, I'm all in. I think that there are lots of grandparents out in the country like me. I have six grandchildren that we all care about and what we love more than anything are those children. And I want to live smart and see, see this through, but I don't want the whole country to be sacrificed. And that's what I see happening. Patrick's comments expose the logic underpinning the vast majority of governmental decisions made in response to the growing pandemic, that capital is more important than life. As the, world, as the world was just beginning to understand how the virus operated and which demographics were most likely to contract the virus, much of the national, national and international dialogue centered around the notion that the young and the relatively healthy were at low risk of dying from the disease. Most, particularly on the right, went so far as to suggest that herd immunity was the best way to handle the virus until a vaccine was developed. One of the many problems with this logic was that it, requ it would require exposing our elderly and sick to populations already deemed expendable by capitalist logic to a virus that had no cure, condemning them almost certainly to death. In response to this absurd notion, uh, Brie Newsom Bass tweeted on March 24th that, quote, everyone arguing that one to two percent of the population dying isn't a big deal should identify one or two close family members or friends they are willing to sacrifice at the, for, at the moment for capitalism name them. In a follow-up tweet, she demanded, say their names out loud and speak it into the universe with the same ease that you condemn others to death. Uh, when I initially drafted this essay, that tweet had um, been liked 150,000 times and shared more than 40,000 40, times. Fortunately, the, the argument that a sizable portion of the population should willingly sacrifice themselves is losing traction. However, the fact that it ever had any should be of great concern to us all. Of even greater concern is the later revelation that according to Bob Woodward's book on Trump, Trump was fully aware of the possibility of catastrophic life, um, but decided to play catastrophic loss of life, but decided to play the danger down in order to avoid national panic. Much has been made of the specificities of Trump's mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, this characterization of the havoc wrought by the virus on the American public places entirely too much blame on Trump's gross incompetence and ignores the historical continuities of neoliberal logic at play. Mike Davis explains the long stop and go cycle of pandemic preparedness that facilitated our present state of disaster. Davis explained that in 98, the Clinton administration created a national pharmaceutical stockpile under the CDC management expressly to deal with the pandemic, with pandemic threats. In 2003, the Bush administration changed the name to the National Strategic Stockpile and handed it over to Homeland Security. At that point, there were more than 105 million N95 respirators in the stockpile. In 2009, Obama distributed 100 million of those masks during the H1N1 emergency. But rather than using public funds to replenish the stockpile for the public good, Obama argued that, quote, a better and cheaper solution was to help the private sector develop the production capacity to meet surging demand in a pandemic crisis. The notion that such a public and far reaching concern like pre pandemic preparedness should be left to private, to private sector interests demonstrates a logic, again, that values profit over life, one that cannot be read as the singular folly of the Trump administration. Most significantly, the reasoning undergirding these narratives and, ultimate, and ultimately policy decisions call our attention again to the logic of disposability driving the technologies of death under global racial capitalism. In myriad ways, in spite of the myriad ways I found my time in South Africa to be both restorative and productive for me personally, those same capitalist logics inform the structures of governance there, as I discussed earlier in the cases of Miggles and um, Kosa, um, and, and resulted in um, unnecessary loss of life, as I uh, explained earlier. In Class Struggle in Africa, Kwame Nkrumah rejects the romanticized notions of a pre-colonial Africa free from class struggle, and in fact argues that class struggle is a core detracting factor inhibiting African liberation and unification. He argues that it was in fact the colonial experience in Africa that obscured contradictions for generations, uh, uh, a reality South Africa continues to contend with as a settler colony. The continental African bourgeoisie, just as the US black African bourgeoisie's fundamental interest in preserving capitalist socioeconomic structures continues to harm. 
President Cyril Ramaphosa, arguably a former people's champion, came to power through the trust he cultivated as a leader of the National Union of Mine Workers and the African National Congress, which makes his role in the 2012 massacre of mine workers at Maracana that much more dastardly. As hundreds of mine workers engaged in a peaceful strike for living wages, Ramaphosa reportedly sent these words in an email to Lonman's uh, uh, Chief Commercial Officer Albert Jameson, quote, the terrible events that have unfolded cannot be described as a labor dispute. They are plainly dastardly criminal and must be characterized as such. There needs to be concomitant action to address the situation. This reportedly just 24 hours before police fired live ammunition at the workers, killing 34 and injuring 78 others. Fast forward to 2020, South Africans weathered the first uh, COVID wave relatively well with lockdown measures among the strictest of the world. However, while experimental socialist countries like Cuba and Venezuela um, uh, and even welfare and even white welfare states in, like in the ones in Europe guaranteed job protections, rent freezes, moratoriums on convictions and expanded access to health care. Ramaphosa with a reported net worth of 450 million US dollars was accused in parliament of putting profits before people after a sharp pullback on lockdown measures in the middle of South Africa's winter, even as COVID infections were apparently rising. These are just two of the more well-publicized incidences in a never-ending sea of interracial class conf uh, intra-racial class contradictions. Uh, in his 20 thesis on politics, Enrique Dussel, drawing on the work of Rousseau, offers an understanding of politics beyond the logic of domination. Dussel suggests that politics should be understood as, quote, an activity that organizes and promotes the production, reproduction, and enhancement of the lives of members of that community. End quote. There is no denying um, that the dire economic straits the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela finds itself in now, particularly after the price of oil in the global market dropped precipitously, um, there's no denying the, the dire straits that they find themselves in. Since the election of President Chavez in 98, the Bolivarian Revolution has been a beacon of hope for globally dis dispossessed peoples who saw in the revolution a 21st century alternative to neoliberal racial capitalism. Over the past two decades or more, despite its vast imperfections, the Bolivarian government, in cooperation with its poor Black and Brown citizens, has demonstrated an overwhelming concern with a will to live or the fundamental, the fundamental material determination of the definition of political power. The US and Brazil, among other lack of concern for life and preoccupation with capital exhibits a neoliberal technology of disposal through structural anti-blackness in particular, discriminatory legislation in housing, employment and police practices which maintain and re-inscribe re inequality. Conversely, Venezuela and Cuba's experimentation with socialism at the level of the state demonstrate a logic that lends itself to the preservation of life over capital. Could it possibly be that COVID-19 is the critical turning point in the demise of capitalism that March predicted so long ago? This question and the present reality necessitate that we consider what the spread and varied global successes of containing the virus show us about the value of life in capitalist versus socialist societies. So that's the end of what I want to share for the clip, but I do want to share just a couple more slides. Um, this uh, mural is, was found in Carabobo in, uh, in Venezuela. And what I wanted to, and I wanted to juxtapose this with the fact that the US, it, and what was this? I think this was April of last year. Um, as everybody was struggling to figure out what was happening with COVID, how to deal with it, the US decided to put a bounty on the head of the president of Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela, and um, Diosdado Cabello Rodondo, who is the president of the, of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. Um, and this is, a, this is a part of what I was alluding to when I said that the government was busy um, attempting to orchestrate coups, one of which they, were, they, they still have continued to try to maintain um, through the false imposition of Juan Guaido as um, sitting president, um, a reality that uh, our current president, Joseph Biden, has continued to push forward. So, so much for radical change. Um, so I've already shared this um, about Venezuela, but I wanted to share one thing about the Cuba's vaccine efforts. Um, so Cuba has actually four, I think I need to fix this. Cuba has actually four vaccine trials um, running at the moment um, that do very different things. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to point out about Cuba's um, vaccine is that as the US and Western Europe have 
have purchased, uh, have greedily purchased the, the available vaccines that are out there, um, which has resulted in possibly much of the continent of Africa and Latin America not being able to access uh, vaccines anytime this year and perhaps not even next year, um, I, I've, I would venture to say that Cuba's vaccine efforts are probably going to be among the first that are widely available to people of African descent in, on the continent and in Latin America. Um, but one of the things that is I think promising and perhaps a little disconcerting about Cuba's vaccine efforts is that Cuba doesn't have enough of a sick population to test their vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. And part of this is because of their overwhelming commitment to community health and preventative care rather than what we experience in the US as sort of palliative care. Um, I think I looked at the numbers today. I think Cuba had something like 30,000 COVID cases but has had only about 300 deaths since the pandemic started. And I think Venezuela had something like almost 140,000 cases, but has had less than 1,500 deaths. Um, and I think Venezuela's numbers are even more amazing, considering the fact that the sanctions um, that are being imposed on both countries, but that Venezuela is really struggling with, ha have actually led to other kinds of deaths, right? Because of starvation, because of lack of access to other kinds of things. But that, but the fact that um, their health system has been able to to largely prevent gross loss of life due to COVID, I think it's a product of its long standing relationship with the Cuban health system and the fact that Cuban doctors and educators have been uh, bolstering the Venezuelan public education and public health sector since the onset of the Bolivarian Revolution in, 90, in 98, 99. Um, so the last thing I wanna say is just to end on a sort of lighter note, um, which was again to go back to the point that I was trying to make about um, having the time to kind of think and write. So one of the things that I really appreciated about the initial writing fellowship was that the initial writing fellowship at the Johannesburg Institute brought together 12 creative writers um, and scholars from all over the world um, to essentially be in community with each other. Um, because of COVID, we kind of existed like a bubble um, because we lived in a giant compound, which, you know, it, it, it was unfortunate that I didn't get to actually see more of South Africa, but what was fortunate about that um, was that we had the benefit of reading each other's work, of having this sort of dedicated time and both, and, and both to have other scholars from other fields and to have creative writers who are not necessarily formal academics in that sense give you feedback on your writing I think is, is critical um, and, and even just the time to think right I, I do not know that had I been um, dealing with the pandemic and teaching and struggling with online, uh, struggling with the, with the shift to online in the first half of 2020, that I could have even began to think about the opportunity that came up to write this particular article. Um, and so I think it's something that we need to take very seriously, particularly as UMass Boston thinks about itself as pushing its research agenda forward, what it means to create an environment that allows all of its scholars, but particularly its, its junior faculty and junior faculty of color, the time, space, and effort to think, right? Because, because thinking is a, is a taxing kind of thing, right? And even in terms of writing practice, right? One of the things I struggled a lot, and I, I still struggle with writing practice um, as a graduate student, but another thing that I learned from my experience with other writers um, was how much of a social writer I am. I think so much of graduate school teaches us that in order to be pro productive and prolific writers, we have to close ourselves off into a corner um, and be antisocial. But what I've learned from that time and I've, what I've continued even since I've been back in the States is that I need external accountability. So I log in with my friends on Zoom. I schedule times um, to work together. And I have found that you know, I, I was even participating in the Black Women Studies Association's uh, Word Count Wednesdays. I think I wrote 700 words of this particular article in one Wednesday in a, in a matter of two hours. And, and I think a part of that is an acknowledgement of the fact that so much of writing happens before we actually sit down to write. Um, and that is about taking the time to think, talking things out, uh, working through ideas, and also having people, not just yourself having the time to write and edit, but having other people who have the time to see your work and, and help co-edit your work. Um, and so I think it's something, you know, 
I will put my plug for too. And I know that people who work for uh, who are working with the union are already pushing for this. But I think it's so essential for for UMass Boston to really take seriously the fact that junior faculty and faculty at every stage need time to need dedicated time to write. The, uh, there is a necessity for a pre-tenure sabbatical for junior faculty in order to really be productive at the level UMass is demanding of of young scholars. And I think that, and I would argue that at every stage. Um, and so this, these are just some of my happy memories uh, from South Africa. Um, and so that is it. And I will be happy to entertain any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Lena Brown. That was a very powerful, powerful presentation and amazing work you're doing in writing. I, I, I cannot match up how much you, you're working on. Uh, great videos you've shown us, especially the unison around the world about how people really came together to, to support and, and the memory of, of George Floyd and, and all the brutality was happening with the police. Very, very touching stories from Cape Town. Appreciate you sharing all that. And the most powerful moment for me was when you quoted, you say that the true pandemic is racial capitalism. That, that really marks it for me. Uh, and it's, it's a lot to think about and sink in. And I know our audience are, are excited to be asking questions and, and you know, they have a lot to ask. So I'm going to invite our next uh, moderator for this session, for the Q&A session. Her name is Ellen Busoro. She's a graduate student at the McCormick School and also a member of PAGSA. Uh, Ellen will be taking us through the Q&A session. So please, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please go ahead and start typing it on chat or you can raise up your hand and we'll be able to assist you. Ellen, the floor is yours. Um, hi everyone. Um, I want to thank the moderator, facilitator. The music by Brenda Fassi was amazing. She was an activist, um, the niece of President Nelson Mandela, former president, the late President Nelson Mandela. She's known for her work. Um, speaking out of, about drug use, you know, she came out as an LGBTQ person when it was not popular. She's she, that's good music you played there. Um, I'd like to thank Prof. Dr. Layla Brown for her presentation. That was you linked you sh you brought out an intersection between um, capitalism, um, racism, and you know just and you you brought out uh, such a, and race. You brought out that intersection in a way that, um, and actually did it in such a short time and you dropped so many gems along the way um, that um, it resonated with so many of us. Those of us who are not from America during the George Floyd moment, I think um, if you look back into your countries when most countries were shutting down during the pandemic, for example, I come from Kenya. And I think um, when we had the dusk to dawn lockdown, the police brutality skyrocketed, right? So people are complaining that they're being killed more by the police than even the pandemic. So I think it resonated with the whole world and we had NSARS in, in Nigeria. So thank you so much for that presentation. So I'm gonna take questions from the group. Professor, <laughs> All right. So yeah, Leila, um, uh, um, thank you so much for uh, putting it in perspective for us. Uh, we couldn't have had a better, more topical, I think, you know, Black History in Africa uh, inaugural uh, series with your talk, because you, you know, you really sort of articulated, um, you know, the uh, globality of race on the one hand, you know, um, the sort of very unique uh, manifestations of uh, racial capitalism in a, um, still a post-apartheid, you know, South Africa that really should be you know, um, while it's celebrated as a rainbow, you know, sort of a coalition and democracy, but it's got a lot of really, a lot of, lot of problems in, in, in struggling to, um, you know, attain that ideal, right? You know, and I think you articulated them. But I want to um, ask us to um, take a look at the three main countries that you, um, that you, um, you touch upon, and, and then I'm gonna leave, um, Venezuela and Cuba in, in constant out there, right? You know, as a different subgroup, right? But the United States, uh, Brazil and South Africa, I mean, mm -hmm. there has been uh, tons of literature on comparative racial capitalism on the three countries, right? They mm -hmm. are the most unequal countries in the world economically, 
Um, but there also uh, is the fact that um, um, racial uh, inequality in those three countries is racially skewed, right? You know, with and the way that the pandemic is hitting those three countries is is, is similar. At least we know that in the United States, um, you know, the, the 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 largest victims are people of color and especially you know the black community. Uh, this is the case, the um, invisible case, because nobody's talking about it, but in Brazil as well, where, um, you know, the pandemic is hitting that country, but it's the people in the Flavelas, which are, you know, mostly um, people of color and mostly African heritage, you know, communities that are once again victims of race. You know, we go to South Africa, where, you know, in that troika, you know, they've always said, well, you know, um, well, politically, you know, we are um, a majority, you know, so we own the <laughs> democracy, but economically, um, you know, um, we still have, you know, capital and therefore, you know, the power of the country being, you know, controlled and owned by, you know, a small, you know, white minority. Um, how is, you um, uh, COVID impact, well, of course, COVID is impacting <laughs> mostly people in the, um, in the, what do we call them in South Africa? Um, Township. Township. The, the townships, exactly. In the townships, with the poor townships where, you know, um, the mass working class people live um, and, and the poor classes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so they will be the victims of um, not just um, uh, uh, COVID, you know, uh, contagion and deaths, you know, because of lack of, you know, healthcare, but also um, criminality, you know, because, you know, these curfews, these draconian curfews that they're putting on, uh, on these communities, they're the ones who get the, to be the victims of police uh, violence as well. So, you know, I like the way you, you know, put these three countries in perspective. Um, the joy, though, was hearing about Venezuela. You know, Venezuela, of course, we know in, in the United States has a really controversial, <laughs> you know, most as even the new Biden administration that we all love because he augurs in, you know, a new kind of um, you know, administration for us. But still, you know, it's problematic that um, by recognizing the, um, we don't know if, uh, you know, this guy won, you know, but by continuing, you know, the same kind of, you know, radical um, aggression against the, um, you know, former Chavez, now Maduro regime in, you know, Venezuela and Cuba. What, what are you telling us exactly, um, <laughs> uh, Leila? Are, are you telling us that we really need to sort of rethink, you know, the way we look at those countries and maybe, um, they do have alternative uh, ways of dealing with these crises um, that South Africa and the US and Brazil don't. And if that is the case, could you articulate that more? Sure. Um, so I also wanted to the first part of what you said, I also wanted to just add that the other kinds of, I think, hidden ways that the pandemic, e even in sort of the positive responses is also hitting people is, is even within the realm of education right I mean I think we've had this conversation a lot as it pertains to public school students and maybe you mass more than other types of institutions as a public predominantly um, non-white uh, serving institution but one of the things that really so so I during my time there I became friends with a number of faculty at the University of Johannesburg and the current what is he called I guess Chancellor is what he's called there, um, yes. is very into notions of the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. Um, and so there has been a really active attempt to take this remote shift and make it the norm. The problem in a place like South Africa that um, has uh, what, what they call load shedding, where, where the, the government, you know, presumably to take pressure off the electric grid, uh, you know, cuts power um, for four, sometimes eight hours at a time. Um, and then the number of students who still live in sort of rural areas um, who don't have access, regular access to that type of, just think about the, 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 the number of students um, 
who are being boxed out of potential access to education. Like even, even the University of Hanover itself is an apartheid. It, it's, a, it's a product um, of sort of post-apartheid South Africa. It took all these African universities and brought them together to create this space that was supposed to be one of the kinds of answers to this kind of post-apartheid movement. And you know, there are real big questions about what it means to push so hard for to, to maintain this remote shift. When I don't know about you all, but my students, they are not feeling it. When it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to really being able to interact. And for me, you know, I'm not a person who lectures um, in general. I like, you know, dialogue and you lose a lot of that with the, with even with Zoom, even with all the things that it offers, you lose a lot of that. Um, and so to your second uh, point, I mean, I don't, I think this is for me that it's clear that capitalism kills. And that the way in which the, unit, the, the US, the Western Europe, um, and all the sort of countries that it continues to exploit and operate, I mean, it, it, it does not benefit. It only exploits us as, as, as a general mass of people, poor, poor whites included in that, but particularly for, for Black and brown people. Um, and again, when I say that you know Venezuela and Cuba are imperfect ex experimentations with socialism. I do mean that. I mean, I'm, I don't mean to say that everything about life in both of those places is 100% better. But what I do think is that what it means to run a government with, and with a social economic system that does not, um, that does not necessitate exploitation, but rather, thinks about the, the worth and the value and the contributions of all of its people can exist in a very different kind of way, right? And so that's why for me, even the piece, right? The piece is a kind of initial meditation. And right? I hope for much more work to kind of come out of that. But that's why, you know, it's even called the pandemic of racial capitalism, another world is possible, right? We have to be thinking about, you know, what this moment allows us to see in terms of what do, what do we want to return to and what do we never want to see again? Because, you know, I think a lot of people make the comment, you know, I look forward to returning to normal. Normal wasn't so great for, mm -hmm. for most of us. And so for me, I don't, I mean, I want to be with people again. I want to like go places, but I don't want to return to that. And so I want to take what this time offers us to actually think about what a new world could possibly be. And I, and I have a strong belief as a Pan-Africanist that capitalism ain't it. So that, that, that is essentially that. And I think that we, we as activists, as scholars, as intellectuals, as people need to be looking to the examples of places where people are at least trying to do something different, no matter how imperfect they are. Thank you. So Thank I you. see that Linnell yeah. wrote a question and then I saw another hand. Uh, yeah, so Linnell, 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 Linnell asks in the chat that, um, thank you, Leila. You began your presentation with a video of international demonstrations against the killing of George Floyd and structural racism. Can you talk about any global movements of resistant actions that have emerged in the wake of the pandemic and the deadly costs of racial capitalism it has exposed? To be honest, I would have to say, so this is what I, I truly believe is. So I believe that people who, who see themselves as activists, organized intellectuals, we are always doing this work. And then we are looking for these crucial moments, these critical upheavals to, excuse me, take advantage of a, a, an extra burst in energy, right? So the, the first answer to that is I would say, I, I don't, I haven't followed a lot of new movements what i have followed is the way that existing movements have taken up the the energy of this particular moment to kind of keep doing that work and so for me one of those that i'm also a member of um so in 2019 just before i left to go to south africa i was in venezuela and one of the um in november of 2019 they had this um international kumbe um for afro descendants basically on the left and so it was a it was a four-day meeting um with over 250 representatives from more than 50 countries i think over 30 african countries were represented um but for people all over the african continent the caribbean the u.s um to build this international community of black people particularly um working towards developing uh socialism, like pushing their home countries and having this sort of international uh, conglomerate. And so for me, this is why even um, in the larger book project, um, 
a return to, to think about the sort of um, Pan-American project of Bolivarianismo in relationship to the Pan-Africanist project, um, the kind of arc of Pan-Africanism, right, from all the way from the 1800s as a sort of intellectual project to the sort of mid-1900s as a, a very political working class kind of project. And so what I see in this, in this particular moment, I think is a return to that kind of ethos, right? And so I often, I, I would never argue that the, that the Bolivarian revolution is only a Pan-Africanist project, but I argue that it should also be read as a part of that lineage. Um, and so that's a lot of what I have spent my time looking at is the way, not just, but not, like I said, not just Venezuela, but the way that there is an attempt that is being led, I think, by Venezuela in this particular moment to have some sort of global, increased global solidarity around what it means to rethink um, so the, this particular social economic system to challenge that. Um, you know, one of the programs that I found the that I found and continue to find the most, um, what do you call it? Uh, admirable or exciting that Venezuela has. And I, I, I haven't followed in the last couple months how much they're able to maintain it under the pandemic, um, but they have this program, Funda Yacucho, which is a program yeah. that allows um, students from all over the quote unquote third world, right? So African continent, South Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean to come study things like engineering, medicine, education, um, fully paid for by the Venezuelan government. Their only requirement is that they return to their home countries and work in the public sector. They are not allowed to go work for private companies with the education that the Venezuelan government has supported them. And arguably this creates a sort of, this is like a kind of long vision diplomacy kind of program um, because even one of the, there was a student that was there when I was there from the Gambia who was actually now in government in, in Gambia. Um, and so, you know, I see that as a, um, a very, a program that has a lot of potential and a program that, again, allows us to think about solidarity and diplomacy in a way that is not exploitative, right? Um, so, so, you know, there, I think there are more answers to that, but I think that's the, the short answer that I can give to that at the moment. All right, we're going to take the, probably the last question from Donna Miranda, because we're running out of time, but go ahead, Donna. So thank you, um, and thank you, Layla, for your presentation. Um, one thing I just wanted to think more on with you or really see your perspective is how much does the analogy of a pandemic or the metaphor of a pandemic really apply to racial capitalism? How far are you pushing those mm -hmm. analogies? Because in public health or disease management, um, there are typically five levels of, we'll say, management or control. So you can control a disease, but it's not eliminated, you can eliminate the disease so people don't have it in the area eliminate infections. Um, you can completely eradicate it where there's no living examples, but there's also extinction, um, mm -hmm. which if we're talking about racial capitalism, um, I could see pushing it that way, um, but mm -hmm. I was just seeing how far with pandemic, um, just as an outbreak, a global outbreak of a disease, mm -hmm. how far that analogy is actually going. Is it a metaphor? Is there something deeper connected? So I'm looking forward to hearing. I actually, honestly, to prior to you asking me that question, I haven't thought about that. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I would really like to talk with you more about it. But my my flat answer to that would be extinction. I don't, you know, um, you know, I, and, and to me, extinction is revolution, right? There, and you know, and people see it in different kinds of ways, right? Even, you know, a part of one of the things that I was really um, struck by as Michelle Alexander was kind of progressing in her thoughts um, about the new Jim Crow is that one of the things that she, you know, she, she talks a lot about early on how she was kind of incredulous about the reality of sort of state uh, state sanctioned violence against black people, um, about the sort of the ex expansiveness of the prison industrial complex. Um, and then towards the end, when she sort of left her position at Ohio State, and the reason why she decided to go to, I think it was Union, was that, was, you know, her argument, which, you know, many have made, is that nothing short of a revolution of values and, and culture will actually get us to a place where we can actually live free lives, right? And so for me, that, that if, I if, if I take that analogy and extend it the way you've asked, it would have to be extension, which, and the only way that that could happen is a, is a revolution. Um, I don't, I am not a person who believes that capitalism is something that can be reformed. Um, I think for those people who have, who study it, you see that it has found ways to morph. I mean, and, and, and that's another thing that's interesting about comparing it to like disease, right? In the, because of the ways in which 
capitalism has re has reconfigured itself to look different over time and to become be able to adapt all right like new strains of it that are, that are able to exist in a certain kind of way so i actually really thank you for that question um because that's something that's that's definitely worth thinking about and it's actually an interesting way to think about how to continue the writing so i really i really, really appreciate that and i'll just I'm gonna send you the paper that I was referring to because the it's interesting in public health, there's no extinction of any viruses because mm -hmm. that requires it both in the outside world and the laboratory. Okay. So they keep it alive in the laboratory to keep studying it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's why extinction doesn't happen with viral management, eradication does. So again, mm -hmm. I'll send you the paper and we can talk more, but thank you for that response. Thank you. And I just wanna, um, um, intervene here and say, welcome Dana. Dana is a new assistant professor of philosophy and Africana studies, I believe. And um, Dana, are you still there? Um, you're gonna be next, okay? We're, we're gonna host you in this Africa Scholars Forum. So as you were speaking there, I was just writing down your name and saying, passing it on to my, my staff and saying, you know, we've got to outreach to him. So welcome, um, Dana. This is your opportunity to say hi to everyone, to the community. I know this is your first Africa Scholars event. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, but you know, you're part of this community and I just wanted to welcome you. Thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate the warm welcome. I guess if I'm next, I have to prepare. Just let me know <laughs> way ahead of time. Um, but I'm very happy to be here. I was fortunate to see the announcement. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we can uh, squeeze in one more question from Belkisa. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, thank you, Professor Brown for um, the presentation. I was just curious because I saw that you presented the case about South Africa and how there was also police violence there and uh, uh, the, um, the, when um, alcohol was illegal and uh, cigarettes. And I'm wondering, um, <clears throat> because we also saw a lot of violence across Africa from the police and uh, violence by the police here in the United States is directly connected to race. Is that the case in South Africa? Listen, I would <laughs> argue that the existence of police forces, particularly those that replicate the example of the US and in, in Europe, Western Europe in particular, no matter whether the country is predominantly Black or African or not, the logics of anti-Blackness still tend to dominate structural practice. Um, and then, I mean, again, as you know, as, as uh, Professor Delvey pointed out, it, particularly in the cases of, of, of um, Brazil and South Africa, right? These, these are, you know, these exist on the same sort of level um, in terms of being police states, right? And then even South Africa is, is I guess, unique, right? And I, I'm, I'm careful about that because, you know, I also want to push back against the way South Africa is often exceptionalized in relationship to the continent. But because of the way it continues to exist as a settler colony, is probably the thing, it's probably the most like the US um, that you will find, right? With the exception of the fact that there is actually a black majority, right? Um, that is almost in reverse. But like one of the things, um, oh, that I was gonna mention when Professor Bills was speaking. So also the uneven way in which the alcohol restriction was imposed. So white South Africans or wealthy South Africans who lived in white areas and even Cape Town in general, right? Even though Cape Town has um, you know, a large color population, which is often vilified and demonized by the state. C Cape Town has a, an abundance of wealth as well, right? Um, I went to Cape Town for my birthday in December, and it was like the pandemic. It was not. It was like the pandemic wasn't happening. Like in Joburg, like you could not. Like you couldn't be outside like without a mask on. Everywhere you go, there was hand sanitizer. Somebody taking your your uh, temperature to go into a grocery store, a gas station or whatever. In, in Cape Town, people were living their best lives and just up in people's faces. And I was just like, oh, the pandemic must not be happening here. Kind of like Atlanta, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will say that, you know, folks who lived in wealthier, wider areas, restaurants were serving alcohol, still serving alcohol. People, people are getting killed in front of their homes for two bottles of beer in townships and in wealthy neighborhoods, there are like 
you know, whatever. Like this doesn't really apply to us, right? So, I mean, the 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 police in most of the places that they exist, exist to protect property and white wealth interests. And that is not in our interest as black people, as African people. So the police, to me, I, it, 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 it would not, it never surprises me when I see the police, no matter what the, what the country is operating the way we understand them to operate here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Brown. But let's give her a round of applause again. And let's quickly give a round of applause to um, um, uh, Ellen Basolo. Thank you so much for facilitating this portion uh, you know, of our event. And we also should give a round of applause to Meg Gatonye, who has to leave us now. We've been having so much fun <laughs> that we've gone over by 30 minutes. Um, so I want to close this event. Once again, thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown.